Thank you, Kevin. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our prepared remarks, and we will now set up for our Q&A session. As we do, I'd like to make a few logistics announcements. For those of you watching on the web, please note that we will only be accepting questions from the audience in this room. For those of you in the room, if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. If I call on you, someone will bring you a microphone. Before asking your question, please stand up and state your name and affiliate institution. Please direct your questions to the people on stage. And please ask only one question so that we can get to as many questioners as possible. Since this event is about Sony's entertainment businesses, we will not be fielding questions about other parts of our business. The Q&A session is scheduled to last 45 minutes. Lunch will be available immediately following the Q&A. With that, please let me introduce to you again Kazuo Hirai, Kevin Kelleher, David Hindler, and Michael Linton. The floor is open. Mm -hmm. Who would like to ask the first question? Uh, this, the lady right here in the center, in the front row. I really have to stand up? Okay. Yes, please. So I'm going to ask two, because you're going to make me stand up. Um, so Kaz, um, you come out of the music side, and you you're now in charge of electronics as well. And we've heard a lot about one Sony today. Um, and I'd, so I'm really interested in um, talk about how you're seeing the con conglomerate working together to create incremental cash flow streams and value for shareholders. And then maybe, Michael, to you, why don't you talk about the risks? You guys did a really good job of laying out the opportunities supported by all the senior management. Could you talk about the risks that you see in the business in the next one to three years, please? Yeah. So let, let me, is the microphone on? So let me, let me take the first question on one Sony. I, I think that uh, you know, after the new management team came on board, this is last April, uh, I've been very focused on a lot of things, but one of them has been really to make sure that uh, the various business units uh, within electronics and certainly beyond electronics with the picture company, with the music company, with PlayStation, that we all work under what I call one Sony. Um, and I think we talked about numerous examples today of how we've been uh, actually putting that into practice. And I think that uh, it's very important, obviously, for each of the operating companies, each of the operating units to be profitable in and of themselves. But over and above that, as we layer on the, the One Sony initiatives, it really brings to the forefront the power that we bring as a company with all these various assets. And that's something that's unmatched in, in the industry, whether it's the electronics industry or the entertainment industry. And one great example you saw today of that manifestation, among others, is the new way that we're presenting, for example, the Columbia Lady logo. Uh, before that, we introduced the Sony logo, for example. So those marketing, branding messages, um, I think that we were able to bring to the consumers is also a very important part of that one Sony in, in order to really have the consumers understand that we are in so many different businesses that are working together. So Michael, maybe you want to take a second one? Yeah, I'd, I'd be pleased to. And, and I should say about the, the, the Sony Columbia Lady logo, once we had it done creatively, we sort of asked ourselves, gee, why hadn't we done this four or five years ago? There was a lot that had been done uh, across the company um, under Howard's leadership. I think we've just taken it one level f forward. And when we see how good that looks, we thought, boy, this was, this was an obvious one we should have been doing before. Um, on the risk side of our business, I really there are a couple that, you know, if, if they do keep me awake, uh, I would name them. One is obviously piracy. Uh, piracy continues to be a, bit, a problem for us. It continues to be a problem in the music business, less than it was, because now that there are all of these various ways of people um, getting music online, it's, it's, it's less than it was in the past. Certainly for film, it continues to be a major problem for us. Um, and certain markets have been uh, more adversely affected than others. Uh, uh, Spain being one of them, South Korea being another. Um, so piracy still stays very much on the forefront and hopefully um, what will happen is similar to the, to the music business is that over time as there are more and more digital platforms for film and television, because television is now also subject to piracy, we saw that with Breaking Bad, um, the, the piracy will come down when people can buy it in a legitimate form. The other piece of it is, a, is sort of a, is a softer way to look at it, which is the risk, the real risk in a creative business like ours, which is after all of making content, is being at the leading edge of where the audience is. 
Where we find ourselves oftentimes tripped up is where we try and copycat or we, we try and go for the sure thing. Um, it doesn't matter which of, the which of the various businesses we're in, music, certainly movies and television. And when, we are, when we're behind the audience as opposed to being in front of the audience, willing to take that creative risk, Breaking Bad is a good example of that, um, of being in front of the audience. But when we're behind the audience, that's where we find ourselves um, not doing what we should be doing. And that, that to me, is, 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 a, is always a risk. Next question. Here in the front row again on the end. Thank you. Harai uh, san. Um, Could you state your name and institution? Certainly. Uh, <laughs> Daniel Ernst with, with Hudson Square. Harai uh, san, what I heard today was uh, tremendous uh, depth um, and breadth at Sony Entertainment. Uh, uh, not just the big hits that we know, uh, like uh, uh, Spider Man and James Bond, but uh, early relationships with, with people like Seth Rogen or, or signing uh, Lady Gaga early or you know, working in partnership with Simon Crowell, a tremendous depth. If we go out one or two years, three years, sometime in the future, and that depth uh, of value is still not recognized in the market, uh, might Sony uh, reconsider uh, its stance about listing uh, a minority stake in entertainment businesses? And uh, as a related question, uh, perhaps to uh, Mr. Linton, uh, what I heard also was a lot of very focused investments that, that you make, very disciplined. Um, but sometimes in media, there's uh, big bet opportunities. Things l like uh, Brethren uh, Disney has done with Marvel or Lucas. Uh, are those are things, maybe not those specific deals, but do you have capital resources to make the bigger bets when and if you, you might want to? Thank you. So let me take the first question uh, once again. Um, uh, you know, I'm not going to try to predict uh, what we're going to be doing in two years, three years' time. Uh, but I think one of the important things that we're trying to accomplish literally through uh, you know, an investor day meeting like this is to have um, our investors really understand the depth and the scope of the various entertainment businesses that we're in, because I think a lot of people, unfortunately, see us as perhaps doing you know, motion pictures. But as we presented today, uh, the bulk of the future growth is going to be coming from the television production and the network side of the business. Uh, and then you also saw some presentations on how we're trying to grow the business in the music side over and above recorded music, for example. And so I think it's really important for us to be able to share that sort of information with our investors um, so that we are shedding more light on the business, but having our investors really understand where the value uh, lies within these entertainment businesses. Michael, you want to take Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to answer on, the, on, the, on taking the risk part of it. Um, th the brief answer to that question is yes. Um, first of all, we are willing to take the risks and, and, and take those bigger bets, whether they be um, making bigger movies when they, when they come up or signing big acts on the music side of things. Um, we've never once found ourselves lacking for capital in that area or, frankly, lacking for um, the courage to do so. We do do it with the financial discipline, I think, that's required because we don't want to find ourselves all of a sudden taking enormous write-offs. Um, when it comes to actually going out and purchasing big IP, like the kind you're describing in the case of Star Wars or Marvel, um, I, you know, we, we've never, I personally, I've been now with Sony for a decade, when, whenever I've come to the Sony corpor Corporation and, and seen the need to f have funding that came outside of um, the studio or the music company, because almost the majority of what we do is, in terms of production is actually, yikes, is, uh, is self-funded. But when we have the need to go outside and make an acquisition, we've always found that Sony has provided us with adequate capital to do so. Um, the, 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 the amount of IP on the order of what you just described is, you know, there's not a lot of it out there, frankly. And the one thing I would argue that maybe when you, when you look at what Disney has done as compared to any of the rest of us out there who are doing this is they have actually a few more channels to exploit that kind of IP than we would necessarily theme parks and things like that. So you, you, you have to measure it against that backdrop as well. Next question, all the way over on the left. Uh, may I ask you your original 
from Wunderlich. I just said, question firstly, Sony is one of Japan's flagship you know, companies. You know, Sony is becoming, you know, or Japan's becoming more assertive with uh, Prime Minister you know, Abe. And you've got a number of markets where fantastic growth opportunities, you know, 4.3 billion in TV advertising in India, you know, Chinese music market smaller than Austria or Norway. But do you have any complications on the uh, beyond the CE side in terms of, you know, possibly even with China in terms of getting movies approved for that market and just sort of how do you see the whole framework evolving there? And then secondly, you know, de, fa de facto, you know, Bond is kind of a superhero. You've got the relationship with Dan Jack to contend with. Do you f feel limited by Dan Jack in terms of trying to do a Splinter franchise or anything like that? I know people talked about Jinx on the last movie that probably would, wouldn't have been a good idea, but could you almost set up something that was like quasi, you know, mini Avengers in terms of having more, you know, spinoffs? Would that be complicated on account of Dan Jack? Michael, you want to take that one? Sure, I'd be happy to. So, um, as far I think what you're asking in the first instance, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when you, is is about whether uh, Sony has a problem per se of uh, with its in, in its being a Japanese company in, in, in terms of our getting our movies into a place like China? And the answer is absolutely not. Um, and it comes from actually, a, a, we, we actually have a very, very strong relationship with, with China Film um, and with, with SARF. And that's come out of the fact that, gee, now for almost 20, 25 years, um, a lot of it through Sony Classics, we have been distributing Chinese language movies in this country. Uh, we also were, we distributed and actually produced some of the largest Chinese movies, um, Crouching Tiger, you know, which went on and did over $100 million in this country. Um, so when you, when you look at our reputation in China, it's actually terrific as a studio and, and as a company overall. Um, so we have never had a problem from a, from a quota perspective of getting our American-made movies into that market. Uh, if, I would dare say if you looked at it, we probably punched beyond our weight. So th that, that's never been an issue. As far as spin-offs um, are concerned, we, first of all, we have the next bond. That's, that's gonna, about to be made. Amy talked about that. Um, with, I, do, I don't think Dan Jack or, or uh, Barbara Broccoli or Michael Wilson have ever done a spin-off of, of James Bond, and, and you know, that's really within their purview to sort of determine with MGM. Um, we do very much have the ambition, and Amy spoke to it, about creating a bigger universe around Spider-Man. Um, and there are a number of scripts in the works there, both in terms of the villains and the ancillary superheroes that have worked with Spider-Man, and we're working closely with Marvel and Disney on that stuff. Great, moving to the next question. Gentleman in the front row, on the left. Terrific, thank you. This is Todd Younger from Sanford Bernstein. Uh, a couple questions specifically on the TV, but well, one question and one very quick clarification. So, in your domestic cable networks, for whoever wants to answer it, uh, you think about the game show network. Do you think that you can succeed in the increasingly competitive distribution environment uh, with essentially one? Uh, main uh, nationally distributed cable network, or do you think, and if not, do you think uh, you have the opportunity to acquire somehow more, or exit that exit, or, or how do you, you know, what is your plan uh, domestically given that situation? And then the very quick clarification, sorry for the very uh, specific nature of this, but for all us Breaking Bad fans in the room, I uh, was glad to hear Better Call Saul uh, talked about as a 2014 event in terms of delivering to AMC. Was that 2014 calendar or 2014 fiscal? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Set your DVR. Right. Yeah. Um, so uh, happy to answer both questions. So in answer to the first question, we actually feel pretty good about our position with GSN in, the, in, in, in its renewals with the various MSOs. Um, David Goldhill, who's the CEO of that company, and you know we're also in partnership with, um, with Direct there, although we do have the majority shareholding. Um, we've just renewed the majority of our uh, agreements with the MSO, so we, we feel we're in a good position there. Two comments on that. First, um, there are, I think, still a number of cable uh, networks out there who might be good opportunities for us to marry up with, and we do take a look at those on an ongoing basis. We've also seen tremendous growth um, in 
digital gaming, which came out of Game Show Network in, fir in the first place, skill-based gaming, which is mostly, in fact, all internet-related, um, predominantly now mobile. It's coming actually off the PC platform. And that business has grown and is also within the GSN family. So a lot of the growth with GSN is now gone past the cable channel platform itself into that, into that gaming space. Oh, excuse me. Yes, the most important part, <laughs> calendar 14. <laughs> Sorry about that. I should have said Next that. question. All the way in the back here in the center. Hi, Alan Gould from Evercore Partners. Can you tell us how much of the eight plus billion dollars of entertainment revenue or filmed entertainment revenue comes from the SVOD players? And is that growing? I'm assuming most of it's coming from TV as well. And uh, are you getting much in the film side there? So just a general SVOD question. Yeah, well, a significant amount is coming from SVOD. Our, t our TV business obviously is continuing to grow over the next several years, so obviously the digital formats are going to grow along with that. Um, the film business is going to remain fairly stable and flat from a revenue standpoint, so we're going to get a lot, a lot of revenue out of SVOD. Let me, let me add to one thing about the SVOD that's been critically important, um, especially outside the United States. So what you found outside the United States happening in markets like the UK, France, and others is that there was a single pay operator that dominated the market, whether that be Sky or Canal Plus in France. And that, to all of the studios, presented a problem when your film contracts came up. And the contracts outside the United States are quite short. They're three years in duration. And you were really negotiating with only one party. What's happened now, as the SVOD platforms have come in, whether that be Netflix or Love Film, which is owned by Amazon or others outside, you know, beyond that, is you now, for the first time in many years, have a competitive marketplace for our film and television product, which has been enormously beneficial to us in terms of getting more value for our content. Next question, also in the back on the end. Hi, it's Brandon Ross from BTIG. I have two questions, one on the video side and one on the music side. On the video side, it's been speculated that you've been thinking of using the PlayStation to launch a virtual MVPD. Um, given that programmers say they're willing to license content if the bundle is protected, was wondering what is stopping you. Uh, so let me let me take that question. I think I think your question is based on you know some uh, reporting that was done. I forgot which media it was. Um, and uh, you know we are looking at a variety of different ways of creating more uh, services or delivering more content through our Sony Entertainment Network or our PlayStation Network. Uh, as you probably know, it's actually a very unique network in that the majority of the uh, people on the network are basically you know the, the video game demographic, which is quite different from perhaps other uh, services that potentially may carry uh, traditional video content. Um, so you know, at this point, we don't have uh, you know too much to talk about or to announce, uh, except to say that you know we are looking at a variety of different opportunities for our PlayStation Network and Sony Entertainment Network consumers beyond you know the traditional game and uh, game-related content. Taking the next question here in the center, right, right here, this gentleman here. Tony Weibel, Janny Capital Markets. Uh, this question is directed towards the film division. Stars at a recent analyst day indicated that the rate card that they procured in the renewals goes down for each film going forward, but yet the demand for products seems like it's higher than ever. Are there other opportunities in that pay output window to monetize the film content? I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear. So. Are there other ways to monetize outside of the STARS output agreement that you have, given that STARS has indicated that the rate card for Sony ah, Films yes. is going down? Okay. So first of all, the, the, the rate card steps down quite far out in the deal. So not to specify, but quite far out. And yes, there are other opportunities. For one, for example, our animated movies are not part of the STARS deal. So that, that specifically is, 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 is going to go elsewhere. Any questions on this side of the room? No. Here in the front. Okay. 
Yeah, totally. <laughs> Hi, Richard Kramer from uh, Arate Research. I have two questions. One for Kaz Sarai. You mentioned a ZEP and uh, sort of downstream performance. But we look at companies like Live Nation that have a $6 billion revenue base. How far do you think Sony could, could or should go into that performance uh, space? And wouldn't that be a natural adjunct to the music business? Uh, how widely could you roll out Zep? And then for Michael, uh, uh, we heard a little bit about Crackle and some of your network properties. But you look at, at YouTube, which is, you know, has a billion MAUs right. and is, is just a burgeoning, uh, very fast-growing advertising business. Um, isn't there, isn't that a logical uh, network place to put much more of Sony Entertainment uh, content uh, and, and run that worldwide as, as a global distribution platform, as an adjunct to your TV networks and, and all the other distribution platforms you have? What's preventing that? Thanks. So let me take the first one regarding Zep. Uh, you know, you mentioned Live Nation. Um, obviously, you know, given the number of venues we're talking about, uh, you know, we're not in direct competition, nor do we see that we're going to be a competitor to Live Nation anytime soon. Uh, but, but I do think that, uh, you know, as, as uh, Mr. Morita uh, explained, that, uh, you know, we have a lot of expertise within the music business that we can leverage to get into a lot host of businesses, including the live concert hall business. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, because we are also interested in developing artists at Sony Music internationally, um, as was presented, one of the ways of actually really getting to have new talent uh, you know, work with us early on in their careers is actually through Zep, and that's why we wanted to expand that into some of the Asian markets so that we can tap into the Asian artist market, uh, you know, sooner rather than, you know, some of the other competitors. Uh, and I think that's another way of uh, obviously making money and generating revenue as a concert hall uh, business, but also, again, making sure that we are acquiring talent uh, from the Asian markets or the markets that we do business in, uh, including Japan, obviously, um, of artists. But at the same time, you know, a lot of these artists write their own songs as well, which also bodes well for Sony ATV Music Publishing. Um, and then it starts from there when we can get into visual merchandising, uh, et cetera, that, uh, that we have, uh, especially in Japan. But it's really, again, having another avenue to really tap into artists uh, very soon in their careers. Michael? And thanks, Kaz. And an answer to the question about Crackle, yes, we do see it as a global opportunity. It's one of the reasons why we've expanded it into 22 countries at this point. The, the expectation is to expand it further. Um, we've seen actually uh, tremendous success with it as we, as we take it outside the United States. That's been a relatively recent thing in the last couple of years. So I, I expect you to see it in a lot more places quite soon. Any other questions? Gentleman over here in the orange. Uh, hi, uh, Hamid Korsan, BWS Financial. Uh, what kind of uh, assumption are you making in your revenue guidance as far as TV Everywhere goes and the risk that you could actually lose pricing power as you can go a la carte in the future? Thank you. I wasn't sure of the question. Yeah. TV Everywhere. Can you repeat the, repeat the question? Yeah, can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, yeah. I, I was referring to TV everywhere. We, you were talking about the significance of uh, programming on the network side. So if you're going TV everywhere in the future, let's say 2016, 2017, as, as the MSOs, uh, cable TV operators, roll the service out, uh, what's the risk that you actually lose pricing power as far as your content goes as uh, TV programming? Um, because now you have to market directly to consumers. And I want to know what the risk is to your revenue guidance that you're providing. So l let me try and take that question. I think uh, basically we're, we're making a couple of assumptions. The primary assumption, although I think we're being relatively conservative going forward, is that with, as has been mentioned frequently today, the proliferation of both broadband and devices there is going to be that many more ways of seeing our content or listening to our, or our content um, going forward on a pretty much on a, not even an arithmetical, but an exponential scale. You know, in the past, we were either could either listen to it in the car or the home or watch it in the home, and now you can do that virtually anywhere. So actually, we think that the, the demand and the, and the, for our content and the ability to sell it will increase. To the specifics of what you've described, 
I think for the time being, what we're, we're assuming is that the networks that are currently purchasing our programs will continue to have the financial wherewithal based on the economics they are enjoying to continue to do so. Um, that would be, that would, you know, every, every deal we've been doing, whether it be with FX or AMC, would suggest that to be the case. Here in the center. No, oh, thank you. Uh, Doug Mitchell from Deutsche Bank. So it, Fox at their analyst day outlined for their business in India, 150 million of EBITDA heading towards a billion by the end of the decade. And one of the gems that you outlined quite clearly today is you have a very strong business in India as well. Do you have that kind of growth curve? And if so, is that what is embedded in guidance or would that put you above the guidance that you gave today? Um, it's, it's, it's in the guidance. Uh, I, <laughs> To, to suddenly see, roar, uh, see it roar up to a billion dollars in income, I think would uh, be very aggressive. Uh, not that that, uh, here, here are the fundamental issues. We, we, we have a very, very strong position in India, driven um, by the bouquet of channels that we have, given by the, by the cricket rights that have helped to drive that. Um, we have seen um, tremendous growth in that market and tremendous growth in the profitability of the channel. There are a couple of underlying um, assumptions that we have both made and not made in these figures that will um, go beyond just the natural growth in the market. So one, for example, is the current rupee exchange. You know, we've seen significant devaluation in the rupee this last year as om almost 25%. If the rupee recovers, which you would expect it should do over time, that is not embedded in the figures. The other thing that's not really embedded in the figures properly is, and I know that Fox talked about this as well, is what will happen as the analog switch off comes off, comes on. Because at that point, um, once digitization comes in and we are going to get paid properly for our subscribers, because you know there's a, typically a middleman in, in India as, as in the analog model. Um, we see there to be, and I'm sure Fox does as well, um, significant increase in profits, and um, both in terms of the proper reporting of subscribers, as well as in terms of an increase in subscription rates, as well as just more channels being able to exist on those platforms. So yes, we do see good growth, some of which is not in there. Next question. Over here on the left, towards the back. Uh, Maya Venkatraman, ING. Uh, I have a question on the movie production business. Uh, you talked about cost discipline. I'm just wondering, as the number of films that you're making comes down, at what point you, know, you need a certain level of utilization? You talked about you know, using your distribution for third party as well. But at what point you know, is the pain point of walking away from not making a movie because you have a certain number of fixed costs that you need to use up? How do you think about you know, that relationship as you've gone from 23 to 18? Right. Shall I? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so a couple of things. First of all, I, I, I want to stress uh, at the, at right now that we, we have in no way, shape, or form uh, lost our commitment to the movie business. You know, it's not when we look at the, the cost efficiencies, when we look at um, television channels and television production as growth areas, it's not that we've lost our commitment to the movie business. The movie business sits at the heart and soul of, of the company, and, we, and, and we're very much committed to that. When we look at what is the optimal number of, of movies, and Amy and I have talked about this all the time, um, there are a number of factors that come into play. Um, part of it, only part of it is actually risk. Part of it is how many movies can a marketing department actually handle in a quality way in a given year. You know, if you think about it, 18 is almost one and a half a month, which is a lot. Secondly, um, the other thing to think about, and you've seen the pileup going on over the summertime, and I, there will be a similar pileup, I expect, over Christmas time. There are only so many weekends that are viable to release a picture. You know, I know they say there are 52 weekends in the year. Um, I'm frequently reminded that, you know, probably 40 of those really matter. And so, and then, even, even within that 40, you're, you're down to a smaller number when you're into the Christmas and the, and, the, and the summer period. So a lot of that drives the decision to get to, to 18. Um, I do think you need a certain number of movies to make certain that you have enough 
revenue to, pa to cover the overhead of our distribution apparatus. I think given all of the various labels that we have, we will be able adequately to, to reach that number. We certainly have enough talented people here to create it. There's also, candidly, and, and the acquisitions business that was referred to in Amy's presentation, there, is a lot, there are a lot of movies in the marketplace, quality movies, and we've made good money on them, like The Call, like a number of other movies, that are looking for distribution every year. That, and, and they basically come on a fee basis. So to the extent to which you can't fill out those 18, you can always pick those up. So we, we don't, to answer your question, and I know this is a long-winded way of getting there, we would never make a movie if the economics of that movie itself didn't play out just to fill up the pipeline so we get to a critical number. That is completely verboten. We would not do that. Let me also add that it's not a dramatic decrease in the number of movies that we're making. This is going back a few years. We've only reduced by a couple the number of movies that we're um, not making anymore. So it's not, a big, it's not a big change. Next question. Here in the back on the left. Uh, hi, Ben Mogul, uh, Stifo. Michael, your comments about Breaking Bad and piracy, if you guys were to have more VOD you know, episodes on the entire current season, maybe even earlier seasons, would that help it? And I'm kind of curious, you know, that's always been a consumer frustration is there's not enough episodes you know, from the you know, previous season or even earlier in the season to sort of get caught up. Would that sort of help on the piracy front? You know, I, I, I think this, the, the single biggest issue, and, and, and Steve Moscow would, would, would agree, is not so much piracy in the United States at the moment, but it's piracy outside the United States. And I think we need to replicate more in the television side of the business what we've learned in the motion picture side of the business, which is unless you go day and date with the, with the big properties, there tends to be, because you know, when you have something popular, people want to see it. So if the store is closed on Sunday, they tend to break the glass. And that's a little bit what's happened with properties like Breaking Bad. The television business at this point is still the, 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 the networks outside the United States on occasion roll out their broadcast of the show post the time that AMC would do here or whatever the network would, would do here. I think as we tighten that window and have sort of, I don't know whether you can get to a day and date point, but you get to the place where it's you know, within a week or even a month, um, that, it, that will take care of a lot of it. Any other questions? This is your chance. Here on the, on the aisle. Dan Medina from uh, Needham and Company. Uh, this question is for Michael and Kaz. Um, just uh, how has Third Point's involvement with Sony uh, affected how you operate your businesses? Well, let me let me try to take that. Um, you know, I, I get that question uh, fairly often. But I, I think one of the things that's uh, you know given us the, is the opportunity that that we're, we present our business. Uh, and uh, you know, there's been more focus on our entertainment businesses, more renewed interest, if you will. Um, and again, uh, you know, I, I think I talked about the value of being able to hold a, a conference like this. Again, to really have everybody understand the value of our investments, uh, or sorry, the value of our entertainment businesses. Uh, and uh, you know, that's something that is uh, one of the direct uh, you know things that have come out of uh, Third Point's uh, you know the recommendations or letter. Um, and also, I think that uh, you know, we talked about accountability. We talked about the focus on costs. Uh, and uh, you know, we also talked about in the letter that we could do better on margins. And that's something that you know, we've been constantly talking about. And again, an opportunity to share what we're doing in the department to make sure that you know, our margins are improving and how we intend to uh, increase our revenue. And so again, you know, it, really an opportunity to shed light on the business and to really explain to everybody you know, uh, where we think the business is and where we think the business is going. So you know, that's, that's been a positive for us. Michael, maybe if you have any additional no, comments. No, I, I, would, I would mirror your comments. I mean, it, 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 it was the impetus for us to show our wares, which yep. has been a pleasure, frankly. Uh, and and uh, I'm, I'm delighted that we could do that. I, I do think we have, as, as, as Dave and Kevin have mentioned, been pretty rigorous about cost cutting and making sure that we are efficient in the way we do our business. We can always be more efficient. We can always be, um, uh, do a little bit better. And so to have somebody um, intelligent making remarks about, or, or, or giving a, uh, advice on this, 
is, is always helpful, especially when they're a shareholder. So it's, you know, I, I see it in those terms. Any final questions? Gentleman in the back. Um, Brandon Ross from BTIG again. Um, on the music side, um, with streaming eating into download growth, how important is it for you guys to get higher rates on internet radio in the future, especially with you know some of the free internet radio guys talking about getting l materially lower rates in 16? Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, you know, for, from, in terms of the rates right now, that it's 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 all set by you know the compulsory rates is set set by the copyright board. Uh, you know, we're, we're happy with the rates now. We're happy with you know as internet radio grows. You know, as a rec master recording rights owners, we we didn't get paid. We don't get paid for the performance of our music on terrestrial radio in the U.S. We do in other countries, but not in the U.S. So the fact that you know Pandora, they have 70 million active users that are doing have a tremendous amount of streaming activity. That's just a new revenue stream that, quite frankly, didn't exist two or three years ago. So we're looking at you know Apple's radio uh, service that just launched. Hopefully, that's going to get a, a big take up. But as, as Doug mentioned in his in his remarks, you know when you look at the growth in streaming as a dig digital channel, which we think is going to grow compound rates of 30 plus percent per year over the next few years. We think that uh, internet radio is going to, and satellite radio is going to continue to be a, a pretty strong growth channel, as well as video. You know, the video platforms with YouTube and Vivo, you know, there's a tremendous amount of uh, revenue opportunity there that didn't exist, quite frankly, three or four years ago. We were spending a lot of money creating these videos. Now we've got outlets that reach millions and millions of people. And it's uh, you know it's it really bodes well for where the industry is going and the and the uh, the optimism that we have with respect to the, the digital growth. We'll take one final question if there is one. Over here on on the left side. Uh, Maya, Maya Venkatramana and G again. Uh, just wanted to follow up on the one Sony bid. Uh, is there an arm's length uh, pricing arrangement when? Uh, either the movies or the music business, so even within Sony Entertainment or Sony Entertainment to the electronics business, for instance, uh, either how content or your talent is priced, or do, do the divisions have some sort of an internal advantage from owning some of this content? So whether it's music in your movies, your movies in 4K for TVs, um, what is the advantage that all of that brings to one Sony, the That's, one Sony strategy? Sure, I'll, I'll take that first. That's a good question. Um, Actually, uh, you know, as we work through a lot of these initiatives, obviously, uh, for example, in some of the instances where it's marketing related, say, for example, with an electronics product or service, and we want to utilize the services of a particular artist, then uh, obviously there, there has to be a negotiation that's more or less arm's length um, to really get the deal done, mainly because obviously, if it's, Sony, if it's a Sony Music artist, Sony Music then needs to have that participation with the artist, and they can't turn to the artist to say, you signed with Sony Music, and therefore we just did a deal with electronics, so you get a lower rate. Uh, that doesn't work. Uh, what I think is the advantage, really, is less so in actually negotiating the deals, but having access to those discussions uh, really on an early basis. Like, for example, uh, you know that we have The Amazing Spider-Man, the sequel, coming up next year. Um, we've already had numerous, you know, one Sony meetings uh, here in Culver City and others where everybody's getting together to talk about the potential marketing opportunities, promotional opportunities, uh, and that, that sort of uh, discussion doesn't happen with perhaps other organizations, other companies. How we divvy up the revenue source or how we pay for the promotion merchandise, that stuff, you know, again, each of the individual companies are responsible with their p and so we have to look at it in that light. So it's more about the access, the availability, the early uh, discussions, which I think makes a difference. And, 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 in, and also in some instance, other instances, like for example, where we're providing uh, SP content in 4K to just the 4K Sony televisions, uh, that's more of a unique opportunity where we said, uh, you know, that, that's a complete differentiator for so many televisions, so why don't we go ahead and do that? Again, it's all about that access that other electronics manufacturers don't have to the 4K content. I don't know, Michael, if you had anything yeah, to I, add. Yeah, I, I can comment on a couple of things. I, I agree with everything Kaz has said. 
there is a fiduciary on, on, on the part of the entertainment companies to our partners in, in whether it be film, television, music, whatever, to make certain that they are properly rewarded. There's obviously certain uh, pieces of content we have that we own outright where that fiduciary doesn't exist and they're, they're, you don't necessarily need to have an arm's length. But when it comes to actually a shorthand um, or, or a shorthand of conversation or us being willing to do stuff on, a, on an experimental or um, trial basis that we would not in the normal course of things want to do, um, we as the entertainment company, and that happens frequently, when I say frequently, constantly, we lean very, very far forward in working with Sony Electronics and working with the PlayStation group and working with the, with the mobile group. And so, you know, we talked briefly, I think it was um, Edgar talked about this music bundle that's been put on the Xperia phone in India where it's bundled actually with the phone. I don't know whether in the normal course of things we would have done that with a third party mobile provider. I dare say we wouldn't. Um, obviously, we're going to compensate the, 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 the participants in that, but that's not something we necessarily do. On the 4K piece, um, that's something actually that Kaz and I worked very, very closely together on. There, was, there wasn't adequate content in the marketplace at the time that, the, that, the, that, that Sony was bringing these televisions to market. And so the studio made a concerted effort, both on the film and the television side, to make certain that we, had, we would either convert um, film and television product to 4K or shoot in 4K um, so that there was enough content to make sure that would there would be there for the launch of the television set, which there was plenty of. And then we went out and evangelized it um, to the rest of the industry, and they're now following suit. So in that particular instance, that's a good example of how we sort of you know, help a product get pushed forward. And I'll just raise one more example where I think we talked on a couple of presentations about uh, the uh, One Sony initiative for One Direction where you know, SB did the motion picture uh, for the Sony Music Artist One Direction. Uh, the other component to that was uh, you know, they, they could have shot this in, it didn't have to be in 4K, but you know, we got Sony Electronics involved to say, if you're shooting this movie anyway, then you know, let us uh, provide you access to 4K equipment so that you can shoot this in 4K, which basically means a better experience for the customers going to the movie theaters to see this, but also it's another 4K library uh, piece of content that we could utilize later on in promoting our TVs um, or other network services. So again, so there's that component that comes in, which is something that again, you know, if, if it's three different uh, companies trying to work on a project like this, it's gonna take a lot longer to get done. And sometimes, you know, these deals just don't come together. Whereas if you're just working under one corporate umbrella, you know, everybody's in the same direction, wanting to do the right thing for the organizations that they serve, but also wider Sony, these things come together a lot quicker. Thank you, Kazuo, Kevin, David, and Michael. And thank you all for attending the Sony Entertainment Investor Day. Today's webcast will be available for replay on Sony's website, along with the slides from today's presentation. If you exit the way you came in and go right around the corner, you'll be able to find lunch outside the door. You're welcome to come back into this room and eat it here. Thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.